35, verses 1 through 8. I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your all-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. Thank you, Marlene. Isn't that amazing? Mar Marlene's having heart surgery tomorrow morning and is helping with worship today. Isn't that awesome? I love that. That's some commitment. And not, not just for Marlene. I'm, I'm so grateful to uh, all of the ladies that are helping today. So grateful to them. You know, Kate Zimmerly, who was, who was speaking earlier, she helps coordinate the uh, American Baptist Women's Group that meets here at church and, and just does a fantastic job. And so often, so often, um, a lot of the work they do is behind the scenes. You know, rolling the bandages and, and uh, the stuff they do is behind the scenes. So it's, it's, it's nice to see them out front serving, you know, so they can be applauded for that. Not, not that they do it for the applause or for recognition, but it's important for us, isn't it, to be able to recognize those who serve selflessly. It is important for us. And I, at the same time, I, I, I want to thank all the other women who serve on a regular basis. You know, Lori is, is up here singing for us every week, helping to lead us in singing every week. Um, Alyssa does that. Marissa and Callie have been up here singing before. We, all, we have Sue and, uh, and Jerry and Lindsay in the back running slides and running our video. Amanda Sisson was up here a couple weeks ago doing readings. So it's, it's really nice to see um, women being involved in an active way in our, in our worship. Um, and this doesn't even mention the dozens that continue to work self behind the scenes, continuing to serve and, and to bless God's people. Really, is an, it's a privilege for me to be able to serve alongside of them, and I'm grateful for the example that they set. But you want to you know something that's just mind-blowing? You want to hear something that's mind-boggling? This is amazing thing. 50 years ago, 50 years ago, it would have been unheard of to have women helping lead worship. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? I mean, women were, were allowed to, to teach Sunday school, clean up after communion, but doing a reading in church, leading worship? Absolutely not. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that amazing? For, I know, we have pastors, women pastors. For 2,000 years, women served behind the scenes. And the church has just recently figured out that women have been gifted in the same way that men have to serve the church and to bless God's people. Isn't that nuts to think about that? It took us 2,000 years to figure this out. Isn't that crazy? And the same is true with our students. I mean, we have, we have students that help with worship all the time, don't we? We have them serving as ushers and as greeters, and they, ha they do readings, and they help with, with communion. And what a blessing to have a church that embraces their gifts that lifts them up and understands and recognizes that God has given them those gifts in order to serve the church and to serve him. Isn't that great? Because I'll tell you what, there's a lot of churches that don't. There's a lot of churches that don't recognize that. So what a blessing. I love that we've got a women's ministry Sunday, that we've got youth Sundays that encourage people to come up and use the gifts that God has given to them. I just love that. I want you to do me a favor. Take, take out your, your program for today, your bulletin for today, and, uh, and, and turn it to the back. Turn to the back page of that on the very back. Because I think this is, this is really neat. Take a look down at the, at the very, very uh, bottom of that program. Do you see what it says there? It says, American Baptist Women's Ministries is Christ-centered, committed to encourage and empower women and girls to serve God. Isn't that cool? to empower women and girls to serve God. Look up just a little bit from that where it says a time to serve. You see that? A time to serve. The 2013-2015 program theme of American Baptist Women's Ministries will help you understand how you have been uniquely shaped by God for the ministry to which you have been called 
and sent out to the world. And I was reading that and I thought, that is so cool. How you have been uniquely shaped by God for the ministry to which you have been called and sent out into the world. Now clearly, I mean, that's just not, that's not just for women, right? I mean, that's, that, that really applies to all of us, isn't it? You know, when you look at what Paul says in, in the New Testament, in his New Testament letters about the body of Christ, he's talking about the fact that all people who are connected to Christ have been uniquely shaped by God to fulfill the ministry that he calls them to do. All of us, right? Galatians chapter 3. Do you guys remember Galatians chapter 3 where Paul says that in Christ there is no male or female? That there's no distinction between genders or races in Christ? But in Christ, all of us are called to serve God. All of us have been gifted to serve God. It doesn't matter what, what gender you are, how old you are, what nationality, what race. All of us in Christ have been called to serve God. I mean, this is, when I look at that, when I look at that passage, it makes it even more puzzling that it took us 2,000 years to put this into practice. I mean, let me ask you this, seriously. Can it get any clearer than that? That in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Is it, can it be any clearer than that? How did it take us 2,000 years to put these words into practice. I don't know. You know what's even more puzzling, though? Sometimes we still don't put them into practice today. You know, and I'm not talking about the church. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about us individually. And I'm not, I'm not talking about just women or just students, but I'm talking, about, I'm talking about each individual believer, every single one of us. You know, when you look at this, when you look at this and it says... We want to help us understand how we have been uniquely shaped by God for the ministry to which you... You have been uniquely shaped by God to do ministry in sharing the good news. That, doesn't, that, doesn't that apply to all of us, doesn't it? I mean, I want seriously think, seriously. Is there anyone in this room that God does not want to use in impacting the world? I mean, is there, is, there, is there anyone about whom God's going, hmm, I'm not sure I can really figure out a way to use that one. I mean, a couple of us come kind of close maybe, but, I mean, isn't, but isn't it true though? We all have gifts. There are so many gifts in this room. Every single person has been gifted in this unique way. But, but just, like, just like the church limited women in how they could serve for 2,000 years, we kind, of, we kind of limit ourselves today, don't we? We kind of limit ourselves. You know, you look at this at the front of your program. It says, a time to serve. This is the theme. A time to serve. What do you suppose, what do you suppose that means? What do, you mean, what, do you think they're, what do you think they're saying? A time to serve. When is the time to serve? When is it? I mean, it, it seems like the right answer would be now, right? Doesn't that seem like it's the, the, the appropriate answer that now is the time to serve, that now is? But, but I, want you to, I want you to walk, me, walk with me through this. If now is the time to serve, and if each one of us has been uniquely gifted for service, if every one of us is equipped and uniquely gifted, and if now is the time to serve, why isn't everyone serving in some capacity? Why? Where's, where's the disconnect? I mean, why is, it, why is it so hard to find volunteers for Family Promise? Why is it so hard to find helpers to help with our youth programs or, or other things like that? Do you understand? If, if everybody has a gift, everybody is gifted to serve, and now is the time to serve, why isn't everybody serving? Do you guys, have you guys heard about the 80-20 rule? Sometimes it's the 90-10 rule where 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. Have you heard about that? Have you found it to be true? I have. I hate to say it. It's so true and it's so applicable. It is. But if every person has been uniquely shaped by God, if every person has... And if now is the time to serve, 
Why aren't 100% of the people doing 100% of the work? Do you, you think about this? Do you ever think about this? I think, I, I think there's a couple reasons, though. I do. I think one of the reasons that people struggle with kind of the servant attitude, a willingness. You, you remember the song we sang, Here I Am, Lord? I think we, sometimes people struggle to say, to, with raising their hand because, because so often we, feel, we don't feel qualified to serve God in a unique way. We don't, we don't feel like we are worthy to be used in a special way. Don't you guys find this to be true? I mean, we, we, I'm very aware of my own imperfections. I'm very aware of my inadequacies and where I fall short. And I think that somehow that disqualifies me from being used by God in a special way. I don't think I'm worthy of this. And I think, this, I think a lot of people feel this way. But I want you to look at something with me. I want you to look, if you have a Bible with you, turn to um, Isaiah chapter 6. And if you don't have one, there's, there's pew Bibles right here. Um, the, in the blue ones, Isaiah chapter 6 is on page 569. Um, if you have one of those large print ones in front of you, it's on page 1058. But uh, Isaiah is one of the prophets in the Old Testament. So if you go, if you're not sure where it is, if you go like right in the center of your Bible, right about there, you'll end up in the Psalms. And then the prophets come pretty shortly after the Psalms, and Isaiah is the first of the major prophets. So skip past Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and you get into Isaiah. Now go to Isaiah chapter 6. Like I said, that's page 569 or 1058. This is a great story. If you've never seen this before, this is, this is a fantastic story. So if you look at chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, down in, in verse 1, you'll see that Isaiah ends up in, in the throne room of God. He's in God's throne room. And, and God is there in all of his glory and there's smoke filling the room and there's angels flying back and forth and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Now, imagine being there. It's you, God, and angels. How do you feel? Probably really small. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Brian's going really small. And this is how Isaiah felt too, right? He feels totally unworthy to be there. He feels very out of place. And he says so in verse 5. He says, then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. That, what he's saying there is, I'm not worthy to be here. I am not supposed to be here. I don't deserve this. I am not good enough to be here. But look at what happens right after that. Look at what happens next in verse 6. Then one of the seraphim, that's an angel, right? One of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And he touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me. Now in that moment, after those coal, at coal touched his lips and he had been declared free, declared clean, what was the message that God wanted sent to his people? Did Isaiah know? Did he know what he was signing up for? Nope. Didn't ask for any details at all, did he? Was this going to be a good message? I like delivering good messages. Was this going to be a bad message? Isaiah had no idea. When did God want him to start? Was this going to be like right away or is this some future date that I'm signing up for? Isaiah had no idea. He didn't know if this was going to be a, a difficult message. He didn't know if this would cause him danger. He didn't know how long this was going to take or if this would interfere with his plans. He just shot his hand up in the air and said, I'll go. I'll do it. You know, Isaiah, you look at this. Isaiah is the perfect example of a willing servant. And you look at this, it comes out of his forgiveness, doesn't it? He had been declared clean in the sight of God. He'd been given a new identity, a new life, a new chance. And he wanted to use that opportunity to serve God however God wanted to use him. When was the right time for Isaiah to serve? Right now. Right now is the time to serve. And I think that one of the reasons that we don't raise our hands and, and, and volunteer for things and get involved is because we don't feel worthy. We don't feel called. We feel disqualified. Clearly, you see in Isaiah, it is God who qualifies you. 
it is not you who qualify yourself. Is that true? True? Yeah. Yep. So, so God takes away the obstacles, and he just wants to know if we have a willing spirit. That's what he wants to know. Okay, so that's one reason. One reason that we don't raise our hands, we don't feel qualified, God takes care of that. But another reason that we don't raise our hands, I think we don't volunteer, we struggle with the servant spirit, is that we worry that God's plans are going to interfere with our own plans. Right, that God's plans are going to conflict with our plans. Because I'll admit to you guys, I'm a busy guy. I've got things to do. I've got places to go. I've got people to see. I have got my life to run I'm not so sure, God, that I've got time for this right now. Maybe ask me later. Right? We worry that if God has something for us to do, if he's got a plan for us, it may conflict with our own plans. And if that happens, if God's plans conflict with our plans, who wins out? <laughs> well, in theory, God wins, right? In reality, our plans usually trump God's plans. If we have something that we want to do, we do it. And then we say, God, if I've got time, I'll do your stuff later. Ah, goodness gracious. I, I love the way that Paul addresses this in the Bible. If you've still got your Bible open, flip it back to Acts. Go back. It's in the New Testament, so you've got to flip way to the back here. And we're going to go to Acts chapter 20. Go to Acts chapter 20. If you have one of those blue Bibles, it's on page 925. 1714 in the large print, 925 or 1714 in the large print. If, if, you're look, if you're ever trying to figure out like where these things are in the Bible, the, the beginning of the New Testament are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They tell the story of Jesus. And the next book is Acts. And it tells how the church grew. It talks about the acts of the apostles, how the apostles and the disciples took the word out through, the, use, through the, the gift of the Holy Spirit and started the church. So it's good book, good stuff. And if you look in, in, in chapter 20, um, Paul, this is about Paul. And Paul's a, a normal guy just like us, right? He's got plans. He's got things that he needs to do, a life that he's trying to live. But look what he says. Look what he says in verse 22. Look what he says in verse 22. And now I am bound by the Spirit. Now stop for a second. I am bound by the Spirit. What does that bring to your mind? I am bound by the Spirit. I am compelled by the Holy Spirit. This is God's plan that he's talking about. I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Not my plan, Paul says. I am bound by the Spirit to go. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city, that jail and suffering lie ahead. That does not sound like a fun plan, but he is bound to go. But look at this. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? I mean, this is, you, you, look, at, you look at Isaiah and his complete willingness to go where God wanted him to go. And you see the same thing here with Paul. And Paul gets it. He really understands that once you've been redeemed, once you've been set free, once you've been cleansed by God, he understands that his life does not belong to him anymore. Isn't that what he says? He goes, my life is worth nothing to me if I don't use it to serve Jesus. He goes, I'm, I am ready to live for him. I am ready to serve him. I am ready to please him. So Paul says, whatever plans I had are now on the back burner if God has something that he wants me to do. That's amazing, isn't it? How often do we see that kind of that servant attitude, that uh, ready, willing, and able to do whatever God wants me to do anywhere, anytime, anyhow? How often do we see that attitude today? Not very often, right? But sometimes we do. I remember, I remember when I first came to this church, this was six years ago, and I remember standing right here, and I've only been here for like two months, you know? You guys didn't know me. I didn't have any chips to cash in or anything, and I said, who wants to help me with junior high camp? And I'll tell you what, without a moment's hesitation, Patrick Entine's hand, right back there, shot up into the air. <laughs> and Pat didn't know anything about this camp. He didn't know where it was. 
He didn't know when it was. He didn't know what would be expected of him. He didn't know, he didn't know anything about this. He just shot up his hand and he said, I'll go. And I remember thinking, man, I like that guy. <laughs> and you know what? Six years later, here we are six years later, and Pat is going to be taken over that week at camp starting this next summer. He's taken it over and going to run that by himself. And he is going to excel because he was willing to say, here I am, Lord. I will do what you want me to do. And he didn't care if it conflicted with his plans. He didn't care. He was going to put God's plans first and God's going to bless him through that. And I mean, isn't that the attitude that God's looking for with every one of his children? Isn't that what God wants to see in us? Not just a desire to follow him, not just a desire to love him, but doesn't he want to see that we trust him enough to do what he wants us to do, even if it does conflict with our plans? Isn't that what he wants to see? You know, whether you're a man or a woman, no matter what, what race or nationality, it doesn't matter if you are a senior citizen or if you're a teenager or a child, what God wants to know is, are you available? Are you available? And the funny thing is, I, have, I, I don't know if every single one of you said, I'm ready to serve right now, right now, I don't know what all God would want all of you to do. I don't know what it is. I just know that he has a role in mind for every single person. I talked about family promise earlier. You know, and we need help with that. We do. I talked about the youth group. We need help with that. We've got an, a young adult ministry that's going to be starting up soon. We need help with that. I got, I got a note. I got a note from somebody this week wanting to start a ministry that will help people to break drug addictions. Here. Great idea. We need help with that. Stan wants to go door to door in our community taking the love of Christ out into our, out into our, our city. We need help with that. We need help with that. Brian, earlier today, this morning, went and talked to a group of, of driving offenders about his faith and about how God can help turn someone's life around. Man, what God wants to know is are you available? This doesn't even scratch the surface of ways that God wants us to impact the world. It all starts with the question, is this my time to serve? Am I too old? Am I too young? Am I the wrong gender? Am I too busy? In spite of all these things, am I still willing to say yes? Here I am. Send me. I'm going to invite you to pray with me this morning as our ushers come up to collect our morning offering. Here we are, Lord ready to serve you, ready to put your needs ahead of our own. That's the attitude, that's the outlook that we want. We don't, we don't always have that yet. But we want to be available. We want to be eager to serve you. So remind us, Father, that we belong to you. That when we follow you wholeheartedly, there is absolutely no stopping what you can and will do through us. So Lord, today as we present our, our offerings and our tithes to you, humble our hearts and give us a desire to serve you more than ourselves, to serve you more than others. You come first. You come first. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.